My name is Mazen Darwish. I'm a Syrian lawyer, a refugee now in France. Um, the director of the SCM, the Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression. The center start his work in 2003 and registered in France in 2004, but we keep uh, working inside Syria until 2016. Uh, we focus on three programs, uh, justice and uh, accountability, media and freedoms, and uh, civil society and citizenship. This is in, in general. And recently, the center provide, uh, issued a report. And do you mind relating the, the, the findings and conclusions in that report? And I believe it's, sorry, just to frame it, it was about <coughs> repression and attacks on journalists from 2011 through 2022, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, but from our work uh, and one of our project, uh, Violation Documentation Center, which established in 2011. And uh, this report actually covered between 2011 until 2021. Um, we mm, document more than 1,900 attack against journalists, but through our mythology, we uh, recognize and put in our data 1,600 70. Uh, the Syrian government, the regime, is responsible about the majority, almost 80 percent. We are talking about 795 attack against journalists and 61 about uh, media organization and headquarters. Uh, the military opposition responsible about 171. Uh, ISIS 164 and Al-Nusra Front 140, the self-administration uh, Qasad 106, and Russia 78, attack Turkey 38. This is in, in, in general about the numbers. We are talking about 720 uh, extra judicial killing. Uh, 434 uh, arbitrary uh, arrested and 140 and forest disappearance in general. Could you please, because um, I find these numbers in accuracy uh, fascinating, could you tell us a little bit about the methodology that the center used to come up with this information? Yeah. Actually, um, uh, <coughs> We uh, have very strict mythology, even to say who's the journalist and who's the media worker. And also, uh, we only document the attack which related to the journalism work. So any of other chilling, bombing in general, this is, we don't put it in our database. So we are talking about 1,670 crime attack against journalism directly. Against, if I understood properly, against individual journalists. So whatever the result of the attack may be is against individuals identified. Yeah, there is also, as I said, 61 attack against media uh, constitution, uh, uh, but 1,670 against journalist individuals. Is a part of your studies and research to also un understand the patterns of these attacks? And if so, do you mind describing what your findings were? Yeah, actually, I just want to say this is not related to the uprising in 2011. Because you know, this is the behavior or this is a systematic way done from the regime in Syria even before 2011. And all of us know that a lot of journalists, a lot of uh, uh, colleague, media worker, free opinion writer, they went to, to, to the prison. Even if we are talking about after 1980s, which there is a huge massacre in, in Hama, 
even after when we have peaceful situation and that the situation calm down, 19th, uh, uh, 2000, and this period. Uh, this is part from the basis of the Syrian regime, the role of uh, uh, army, forests, into a security service, and uh, uh, try to tight and to all the type of political activity, even the journalism. And since 1963, uh, after directly the coup of Al Ba'ath Party in the same day, they issue the Article Number Four, which forbidden all type of journalism, uh, radio, uh, newspaper, magazines, uh, uh, magazine, and even the uh, printing house. All of it become forbidden since the first day of the coup in 1963. And we are talking about a country uh, ruled in the uh, martial law from 1963 until 2011. But even after 2011, uh, yeah, the, the, the regime stopped uh, uh, active the martial law, but in the same day, they give, they change the law and give authority for the security service, and the Syrian security service it's become part from the jurisdiction. So they stop the martial law, but they give the authority by the law for the security service to arrested people. With extra uh, articles of uh, immunity for the security service, the immunity is a start since 1966, when they establish the state security. In the same time, they give this immunity for the security service. But even in 2011, there is also additional two law give more security, uh, more immunity for the security service. Okay, I'm going to stop you there so that we can get the time frame because these are laws that are relevant uh, for the repression. So if I understood well, in 1963, is Article 4 as opposed of what law? This is the, the coup of al Ba'ath party. So they have this statement of the, of the coup, the, 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 the military statement. That criminalizes or at least restricts dramatically freedom of speech and freedom of press. They forbidden all type of journalism. They close all the newspaper. They close all the publishing house even and the printing house. And just to keep chronologically, if I may, from 1963 until 2011, what we know, uh, we have established throughout the day that the uprising and the revolution begins. Is any additional laws that are enacted uh, or decrees to uh, continue, you know, reduce, for lack of a better word, the, act, the, the work of journalists and media organizations? It's not only the, the, the journalists and media uh, worker, it's about the whole uh, any kind of political or democratic activity in, in the Syria. Because in 1973, we have the new constitution, Hafez al-Assad write it, and in this constitution, the Article 8 said that al Ba'ath party is the leader for the state and the society. And this is by the constitution. So, since 1973, we have the Basque Party who controlled everything, even if we have some kind of uh, decoration uh, uh, syndicate, by example, when we are talking about journalist union, when, if you go to the article two, so it said that the journalist should be serve al Bas goals in uh, uh, their work, and they should be follow the instruction of the uh, uh, al Bas uh, leader. 
So this type of, of political life we have, and there is no way to have a private or uh, independent party. By the, we don't have uh, uh, a party law. Uh, and in 2000, they make changes in the, in the media law, which allow for non-political uh, magazine uh, to be established. But this is give the uh, Minister of Media the full authority to give the permission, the administrative permission. So it's keep in their hand, and they give the license only for those oligarchs who's linked to the authority. So the only daily newspaper we have it's run from the cousin of Bashar al-Assad, Rami Makhlouf. So this type of private media we start to have. And this is the changes that happened. And in that period, uh, we know that everything exacerbated in the context of the revolution in 2011, but in that period, are there any efforts of dissenting or any resistance that could be identified of journalists uh, attempting to go against the regime and being punished consequently? Yeah, um, um, every day, <laughs> daily. This is actually, it's, um, um, yani I think, since the independent, even the Syrian society and the Syrian people and the youth seeking for democratic, for liberal, for normal life, just a normal life. And this is uh, the journalists, uh, lawyers, uh, the judge, they have many uh, movement in this way. And we have, in Syria, we said that we have the massacre of uh, syndicate, which happened in 1980s by Hafez al-Assad, who changed the whole laws about the syndicate to stop this resistance from judge and lawyers and especially the journalists. But after 2000 and with Damascus Spring, many of, of uh, the journalists also start write in foreign media, in Lebanese and in, in Gulf media. And a lot of them was arrested. We have, after 2000, the internet uh, uh, start and the, the web uh, news in Syria. So, a lot of uh, also journalists, uh, free opinion, writer, uh, went to prison. I still remember uh, Habib Saleh, who's uh, write an article in 2001, and he get three years in the prison, then he released and write another uh, uh, article, so he get three years in the prison, and then he released and write the third articles and get three years in the prison. I still remember the third time I go with a bunch of lawyers to the judge, and we told him, they transfer him to the judge, even the judge doesn't meet him. The judge from Al-Qadri family is the first criminal court in Damascus. And we told him, good morning, Mr. Judge, and said, hey, if you are, all of you coming for Habib, the security service send him to me and Mark give him three years in the prison. So please, don't come. No need to, 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 to have lawyers and, and community. The state security send him and with Mark in, in, in the folder, three years. This is before even the judge have the first audition with him. That's actually that's kind of introduction to my next question, which was before we, we enter in the happenings from 2011 on in the decade that we have been uh, witnesses of, prior to that on impunity, and as a lawyer, Mr. Darwish, was it a possibility of addressing the courts, filing complaints? I mean, was it any level of, frankly, functioning uh, on, on redress for the persecution of journalists? Against the journalist, yes, for sure. This is easy. Or in favor of journalists. 
Um, in Syria, we have the, the uh, ordinary penal code, and we have the military penal code, but we have also the extraordinary uh, jurisdiction. Like, we have the uh, military field court, which is responsible about extra judicial killing thousands of the Syrians. Uh, we have a uh, state security court which keep running until 2011 and it's linked to Al-Bas party. It's not part from the jurisdiction, legal jurisdiction ordinary. It's linked to Al-Bas party. And in 2012 when they want to make reform, so they stop the state security court and they create anti-terrorism uh, court in the same place, in the same uh, building even. So <clears throat> we have this, you know, also Soviet Union uh, uh, mentality in the jurisdiction. So there is a huge type of uh, article which mean nothing and could be sent any journalist to, to, to the prison for years. By example, I think 2008, and there is, mm, and someone informed me that in, in Sabra, Damascus, and Adra area, there is a, a conflict between two families. So I go with one of my colleagues, Hassan Kamel, and we go to, 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 to see what is there. After a few hours, we was arrested, and we sent to the military court. And a few days I find myself next to the, the first high military criminal court in Damascus. And then in the end, I was charged. And this is the official wording that he start to write article. If it's published, it will make conflict between the Syrian society. So start writing article if it publish. And this has happened. And this is something ordinary, not something unique. This is very ordinary example. A lot of our friend, colleague, journalist, when they, and this is, <coughs> The Minister of, of, of Information, Muhammad Iskandar, said, I need the journalist like the musician in the uh, orchestra. All of them follow the stick of the Minister of Information. This is the freedom of media or freedom of press in, in, in Syria in this situation. Usually the journalist re-read his article 10 times. One time about the professionalism, if there's a mistake. The nine other time he read, re-read his article to see, is this good for the state security? Is this good for uh, uh, Air Force security? I don't know what the relation with the freedom of the press and Air Force Security Service. But there is a relation. They arrested 15 of the member of SCM. So there is a relation. I don't know what it is. So this is uh, <coughs> the environment, let me say, it, of freedom of expression. Many journalists, Ali Abdullah, by example, he read a... Uh, 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 a letter in, 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 in form, uh, he, he don't write it. He, re, he write, he read it only on paper. And he go to the prison. And what happened to those journalists that went to prison in those years? I mean, what will they relate after being released? <clears throat> Many of them, as told you, they keep working, keep fighting, 
for freedom of press, freedom of expression. A lot of, of Syrian activists, uh, uh, political activists, uh, human rights uh, lawyers, activists, went to prison uh, several times, lose their license, the right to work as a journalist or even lawyers, as happened with me. <coughs> but they keep working keep writing, many of them. Some of them fled, go out of Syria, don't want to continue to go to prison and come back. But in general, since Damascus Spring, there is a mechanism inside the society with the also the new media, the, the social media, the internet, uh, satellite, all of these new type, there is new mechanism inside the society, especially the youth. And when the color revolution started in, in Eastern Europe, by example, we think that this is something Eastern Europe model. So our country, our the Middle East, it's too much far. But when the green revolution started in, 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 in Iran, no, this is, could be happened in the MENA region, in this black hole area. Some reform, some peaceful uh, uh, activity, movement, change could be happened. So there is a new, the huge energy in Syria. Even after Damascus brings a huge number of, of the activists, the leader, they went to prison. Some of them get sanctions 10 years. Uh, in 2003 also, we have another wave in 2004. But the society keep rolling. You were um, in France and since the two early 2000s, with, and the center was operating since 2003, you said. Uh, when after the uprising, after the revolution in March 2011, um, how did you guys? How did you prepare to protect the journalism? How would you um, engage in protecting some of these colleagues? Actually, we only registered the, the, the center in 2004 in France, but we always working inside Syria until 2016 because also in Syria there is no way to register any kind of uh, uh, non-profit organization or non-governmental organization. Um, before 2011, we, we are talking about uh, dozens of activists, of journalists, of uh, politicians, opposition. So it's more easy to, to, to handle, to, to fight for them, to stand with their family, to present them in the, in the courts, to have all the peaceful way of, of uh, human rights activists who can do it for them. Even we know that it's, you know, when they sent to the court, this does not mean that we will have a uh, fair trial and, and the judge independent. And, and we know, as I said, um, in Habib Saleh case, the judge said they sent them to me with three years. Uh, but after 2011, um, there is, it's not about the elite, it's not about the opposition, the human rights defender, those dozens or, or hundreds of, of activists. We are talking about the Syrian society. So thousands, hundreds of thousands of people go to the street, dancing, singing, seeking uh, freedom of democracy, especially in the first few months. And here we find it's not easy to, to, to uh, follow up or to document all the violence from the regime. For this, we create the VDC, Violation Documentation Center, because the scale of violation has become mass, and the type of violation, it's totally different. I was arrested before 2011, 
and after. Before, in, I'm talking about 19s, 2000, and this period up to 2011, I said always torture, uh, uh, unforced disappearance, uh, extra judicial killing, always it's a tools of the regime. But we are talking about the number of, of the victims. It's become huge and mass. So we find that torture used in that period after the 80s to enforce people to give information, to enforce them to sign the, the, the confession as they want. But after 2011, it became torture for revenge, torture to killing the people, torture to destroy them. And torture, especially when we're talking about first period, first few months, it's become some kind of uh, workshop on violence. They brought those youth who's just going, dreaming of, of, of freedoms and liberty and free of press and democratic, and bring them to this security service, emulate them, torture them, uh, give them a, a huge punch, feeling of anger, and they push them, release them. I remember with my colleague, who's disappeared, Khalil Matouk, the lawyer, my teacher, as a lawyer, we met a lot of those just after they release. And still remember, they always said, I prefer to die to go back to the prison. I can't, my body, physically, I can't handle this type of torture. And really in that time, I feel surprised how you prefer to, to die than to go to the prison. But after I go to the prison and the security service after 2011, I totally understand. And at that time, in the, going back to your work at the center, how did you engage uh, with those people released from, from jail? I know that, and when uh, perhaps um, you started looking about accountability and possibilities on accountability for those people. Actually, we as, as um, a Syrian citizen, as a human rights defender, as the SCM center and colleague, we participate with the uprising from the first day, I think. This is one of our dreams, one of our hope years before 2011. So we are involved directly. But again, as I said, after one month in April, we find that there's a huge violation, and we need to take care about documentation because we learn from what happened in Hama in 1982s, 82. While until now there is maybe more than six, 16,000 missing people from Hama massacre. And we said in that time we are just a kids. There is no tools, we don't have knowledge, but now it's our responsibility. But really, unfortunately, we don't think we will have this huge and mass uh, daily continuous massacre. In our database today, there is more than 400,000 names of victims and cases. But really, maybe this is, I don't know, 10%, 20%, 25%. I don't know. This is only what we can document. But the truth is even more and more. <coughs> um, I think we participate in, in 16 uh, March of uh, uh, demonstration next to the uh, MFI, Ministry of Interior 
uh, asking uh, to release the, the political and journalists and lawyers from the prison. And it's peaceful movement, inform even the, 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 the everybody. We put it on social media that we will go on 16 March at 10 a.m. next to the Interior Ministry. And we have a letter we would like to give it to the Minister of Interior Affairs uh, about releasing the, the, the political and human rights defender journalist. And it's, again, totally peaceful. The most dangerous things, we have it, some pictures of the arrested colleague and the friend and the family. And after a few minutes, security service attack, um, women's, children's, all, and arrested, um, punched 30, 40, a protester and uh, Nabil, one of them, and uh, we met in the prison. And uh, he's a friend and colleague before, but this is also the first time we met in the prison. I'm lucky released on um, uh, the same day in the evening, but he and uh, 36 uh, another uh, uh, sent to the court, but also they released after a few days or two weeks. And this is 2011. Yeah, this is 16 March 2011. And you remain working with the center through 2016. When you decide to leave Syria, not yourself, but I mean the center stops operating in Syria. Am I correct about that? Yeah. Yeah, and and in, um, uh, in 16 uh, February 2012. Uh, the Air Force Security Service arrived at our office and arrested all the member and colleague in the office. Um, they I mean, attack the office uh, as like they are attack uh, any, uh, a military unit um, and our office in central of Damascus, and then building civilian. It's publishing a uh, house even. We don't have the right to say SCM or Syrian center. We don't have registration. So it's uh, a publishing house uh, established and rented from Yara, our colleague in that time, and we use the license to, to work as SCM. <coughs> Um, huge number of, of they even cut the road and many military um, uh, uh, cars they attack the office and uh, arrested 14 person uh, from the office and they send us to the uh, Al Mazza military airport where is uh, hold the uh, investigation branch for the air force security service also. You started documenting arrest, torture, potential releases, and also deaths in custody and in jail from really early on. What was the strategy on documenting that? And what do you have in mind in terms of an accountability strategy? As I told you, we tried to learn from what happened in Hama in 1982. And we find that a huge number of, of the victim rights disappear after what happened. I told you one of my uh, neighbor and, 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 and my uh, family house, my father house, um, he's in our age called, uh, maybe I don't want to raise his name. He's my, my neighbor, the family name Darkal. And they arrested in 1982 his father as a Muslim Brotherhood member. I don't know if he is or not. But after nine years, and they knew that they kill him in Tadmor prison. But after nine years, the family in that time pay 
$6,000 to a high position security service to give them this certificate say that there is a, a, a wolf eat him in the desert. Yeah. This is true. I read this certificate. They are my neighbor, and we play together, and I know all the details. So this is one of the reasons that this is not acceptable to 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 see now in this period in our time another family pay thousands of dollars to the killer to find solution. There is a property. There is a marriage. There is they need solution, the families. So in, in April, as I said, we start uh, the VDC, Violation Documentation Center. Uh, our colleague, Dilshad Osman, he make the first platform. We focus, try to focus in the arrested uh, extrajudicial killing in, in, in that period, uh, arbitrary uh, arrested but enforced disappearance, but we don't think that we will have this type of crime, to be honest with you. And I always, until last year, because we changed the system, but until last year, always I said to my colleague and friend, I'm sorry, I do this mistake. I never think that they will use chemical weapons. I don't think in that time in April 2011, I don't imagine that they will use SCOD methods to attack um, um, schools and, and hospitals. I don't put it in my mind. So at that time, create this system to recognize this three uh, category <coughs> only. But yeah. unfortunately, I was wrong at that time. But we updated, upgraded. And how many efforts have been initiated outside of Syria, uh, attempts to initiate outside of Syria uh, accountability efforts, I should say, on behalf of uh, survivors? Yeah, after I released in, in, in 2000, in August 2015, I was released and uh, skipped from Syria in uh, November 2015. Go to Germany and uh, still remember I came to uh, FIDH in, in in Paris and they are my colleague. We are member in December and told them, okay, what we shall do? And they said there is uh, a, case, a dead case for Remy Oshlik and Edith Bouvier in the court. There is many cases, potential cases, but we don't know what we will do on it. And they feel uh, sad and they can't do anything. And I think, still remember, we have a huge big discussion with Antoine Bernard and the lawyer Clemens Spectart, and we would try to put how we can act. In 2016, we start working in using universal jurisdiction, but also dual nationality victim. And we cooperate with ECCHR in Germany, FIDH in France, uh, later OSF, and uh, we start try to see how we can, I don't want to say bring justice to the victim, because justice is something maybe totally different, but when so in 2016, I, I went to Geneva and I met uh, Mr. Stefan uh, Dimstura. And we started talking about sustainable peace in Syria. And I'm talking about my friend, my colleague, this is what I know, the <coughs> killing people, disappearance. And he told me, look, here in Geneva, I have the lord of the war. I have the regime, I have the military opposition. 
I can't ask them accountability. So you need two choices. You need peace, welcome in Geneva. You need accountability. I have the Lord of the War. I can't. And told him, yeah, I need peace, but sustainable peace, not this type of peace, as I understand the peace. So we start fighting to keep the file of peace and <coughs> uh, accountability on the table. These cases, this is not the justice. This is our alternative choices, because we don't have the luxury to go to ICC regarding the veto and from Russia and China. <coughs> we don't have uh, any political transition to create our uh, transitional justice mechanism in Syria. <coughs> and it's clear, as I said, that the lord of the war, especially the regime, Russia, Iran, they don't want any kind of accountability. So all what we do, more than 13 cases, we were just to keep this file on the table, to not allow them to go to any political agreement ignoring the victim rights. To, to whom are these cases? Who are the perpetrators, the main perpetrators in these cases? Um, we work in, the, in three level, in three scale. Or, um, torture and extrajudicial killing. Uh, we have seven cases the responsible the regime. We have one case the responsibility of Jaysh al-Islam, which also kidnapping and uh, our colleague Razan Zaytouni and Wa'il Hamadi, Nazim Hamadi and Samir al-Khalil from Duma, one of their leader, Islam al hold in the prison in France. <coughs> we have three cases in using chemical weapons against civilian and the responsibility it's on the regime are talking about using sarin against civilian. And we have a case regarding bombing a school in Adra, in Dara. And we have uh, uh, dual nationality cases where the, the victim, they have French and uh, uh, nationality or Syrian and the Franco nationality. So we have the Bach family, and we try to do our best in, in Rimi Oshlik and the Death Bouvier and Paul Case and, and attacking uh, Baba Amru Media Center, but also uh, the lawyers, uh, thank to, to, to them, they also succeed to add the Syrian victim as a civil party to the case. So finally, it's not about the nationality of the journalists, it's about the journalism in general. And to present you with the same questions that I um, asked you, <coughs> your uh, colleagues before, did the state, the Syrian regime or the Syrian state, or through any authority of the state, has ever been made a statement or interfered or intervened in any of these accountability efforts? Yeah, I, uh, we, one of the cases, <clears throat> Thank you. I lose my voice in Kiev. So just coming before two days. Um, um, uh, in the Bagh uh, family case, we have uh, uh, three arrest warranty issued against Ali Mamluk, uh, Jamil Al Hassan, and Abdul Salam Mahmoud. And yeah, we have reaction in the official Syrian TV. He said, Nazan Darwish and SCM get money from Al Mossad and CIA, and they are perpetrated. So, uh, 
This is only. Well, there's a reaction. <coughs> and, and lastly, Mr. Douglas, how many times have you been arrested and kept in jail? <coughs> before the, uh, after the revolution, three times, and two times before the revolution. Please take your time. No, no, don't worry. There's no rush. And then in the in your arrest in 2012, if I'm not wrong, did you meet Nabil Al Sharafahi? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think um, this is what Mister said that this is linked even to what happened in in, in Baba Amr and attack the foreign journalist because in that time I believe that the Syrian regime they decided to go to 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 the maskers and to block the country and to close any windows so they start in the <coughs> national uh, institution or journalist who help and support the the, the foreign journalist or even who's try to uh, uh, send information videos news for outside so in, in, in 16 February they attack SCM and I said they arrested 14 person from my colleague actually also our colleague Ayham Ghazul he died under torture so we was arrested 14 but we released 13 one of our colleague killed <coughs> so and after one month, after 10 days, they arrested Nabil Shurbaji. This is also the, the, the beginning of, of the local media talking about inability. And I still start and still remember when Yahya Shurbaji came to our office and have the first issued. It's A4 paper and they just do it like this. And this is, and he came and, and he's, he's wanted one of the most maybe wanted person in Syria and he go to, 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 to media and his face and, and name. And I saw him in the, in the SCM office and I told him, there is two choices. The security service, they are with you and I can understand and we are ready to go to the prison. Otherwise, you are crazy. What you are doing here? You don't come here in the morning. You go to, to the house. You have the key. You go to the house, Razan there. Never coming to him told me, look, I think this is the first issue of Hanabalati. So, Yahya was arrested, Nabil, after us, I think 10 days, maybe, and then the foreign media in, in, in Bab Amr attack. So, if you look to the whole picture, so the Syrian regime decided to close the country, rebuild this iron uh, sur. <laughs> Um, in Syria again. <coughs> I met uh, Nabil. They took us, they sent us to, to the Al Mazza Air Force investigation branch to a military airport. And they separate us the Women's, they put them in one cell and the men in the other cell. And um, the next day they took me out and they separate me from both. And I, after a few days, one month, I, I have anger strike. And in the evening, there's one thing. And it was Nabil and sent me his potato. But this is something huge. Because I think 
يعني افتر وان يير ان ذا اير فورست سكيورتي سيرفيس اي لوز مور ذان 64 كيلو جرام سو اف يو هاف هاف بوتيتو اور سمول بيس اوف بريد ذيس از سمثينج هيوج اف سم ون جيف ات تو يو ذيس از هيوج So I know that uh, Nabil in, in, in the prison, this cell, and we start looking at each other. I know when they all was blinded and left, but you know that when they took him to the investigation, because in the, in all the prison, it's uh, the investigation yard, it's close to the cell, and even you can hear the torture and the people. But I think after um, 60 days um, in the midnight at 1 a.m., 2 p.m., 1 a.m., I don't know, uh, they put us in one chain, 16 person, and they send us to the uh, force division, uh, branch 555. And the... المزم زي you know there is a torture and investigation but it's sometimes for like Nabil like me who have very good experience in, 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 in torture and arrested so we knew that this is some kind of a game between you and the investigator what you should say and this is something before we go to the prison we have our story what we should say what we should ignore what we will who will do what to, so all of this, we are Syrian, we have very good experience with security service. So, you know that this is some kind of battle between you and the uh, soldiers, when they handle you, beating you, tortured you, using boiling water, you know that you need just to, to one minute extra to resistance. And maybe they will stop. And if they stop, you will save a life or a colleague or a name. So this, there's this type of, you know what the uh, guard want and you have this uh, battle even inside. But when we go to the force division, we discover that even they don't know our name. They send us to the cell and the ground, start beating us, and we are in the cell and they don't know even our name. And there in that cell we were 105 person, the human rights defender, like the, the extremism, like the Free Syrian Army, like who just they took him because there is similar name with other wanted people. Someone may be fighting with his wife and she have some relative in, in security service and ask him to take him to the prison or similar. And in that place underground, we have every day two torture session. In the investigation branch, you know that they want information. But in the force division, they don't want anything. <laughs> and even as I told, they don't know our names. Just they have a schedule, checklist. Two days torture. And each five days, one week, ten days, they have something called party. This is extra session. And they came opened the cell and said, okay, the uh, prisoners who have uh, read the graphite, let them go out. Graphite, red. And they start beating all until someone said, yes, I am who have read the graphite. We don't have maybe only the sleep. And then we recognize that, okay, why we should all of us 
tortured and beating. Next time when they ask for something, let us make a queue. So tomorrow if they came, you said that you have the relief. And they came next week, by example, this party and say, okay, who's speaking in the uh, telephone yesterday? Telephone, the cell. But we follow the plan. And one of our friends said, okay, I'm who use the telephone. And they said, no, you are a liar. All of you will touch us. And there is no investigation. They don't want anything. It's torture for torture, only to destroy people. Uh, then they uh, transfer again Nabil to the investigation branch. And a few days, they transfer him to the fourth division, to the branch 55, but to another cell with other colleague from SCM, Mansoor, and Abdurrahman Hamadi, and many other colleagues. But the same. Every day, two torture session, and every few days, there is this party. But Nabil and the other, they want to do their work and document, even in the prison, the names of the prisoners. So, and there's nothing. So you, they use a uh, shirt. And Nabil write the names in the blood and the uh, Metal, Sada. The rest. They mix the blood with the, with the rest and use things. And they write the name of the prisoners and they, Mansoor, they promise that first one he will release. He would take it with him, and Mansoor took it to Adra prison, and then he gave it, we smuggled it to Razan, our colleague, and they published the name. Yeah. So I met Nabil, and then they transferred us to the Adra prison, and again I met Nabil in Adra prison. But we are lucky they transfer us to the uh, anti-terrorist court, we are lucky because they consider us as a terrorism, terrorist. Uh, but Nabil, not, they send him to the military court, military field court. So after they stay in, in, in Adra, a while they transfer him to Sedmaya, while we transfer to a civil in prison, I was transferred to my other colleague, to Suwaida. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. I don't know if the panel has any questions. Do we have any questions from the judges? Yeah, question here. Question here. Gil, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your um, testimony. It was very comprehensive and, and most useful. Uh, I'd like to go back a little bit and uh, ask a couple of questions about um, the methodology and your uh, data. First, I believe you've used a 1973 definition um, from, from the UN uh, of a journalist. And it seems to exclude citizen journalists, uh, bloggers who are the eyes and ears of society. And I wonder if, in, if that's correct, I wonder if in the circumstances now, um, you've had any thoughts about changing the definition Second question, 
I'm not clear about what the difference is in your mind and in the work of your group between journalists and media workers. And third, I'd like to know how many of the 720 extrajudicial killings of journos and media workers were in fact journalists, both um, and, and, and also in the Northeast um, where, where you, you say there were 160 violations. I'm not, not sure how many of those were murdered journalists. And, and, and in the so. armed opposition areas, uh, again, um, I believe you mentioned 196 violations. Um, certainly that's, that's uh, my understanding. Um, and so I would like to know how many of those 196 were journalists. Thank you very much. Actually, Annie, we regularly uh, we check our mythology and our data, and uh, we have uh, even in three MOU with the Trouble I M. And as I said, we work in in several courts in France, Germany, Sweden, Norway, Austria, and many other countries. And we receive every, let me say, just last year we received 65 demand from the war crime unit in nine country, European country, and Canada and America. Why I mention this? Just to say that, yes, we feel comfortable and trust our mythology that it's fit the high uh, criteria and the high level of the legal documentation which accepted from court and fit the UN standards in general. Is all of these 720 journalists and what the difference between the journalist and me media worker? So, yeah, we have difference and we, in our mythology, we have many definition and many category. So said the journalist who's the professional journalist whose work and this is his mean even uh, mean uh, uh, work for living we have a special definition for the uh, journalism uh, photographer and we have the media worker like the fixer, like those who's also working in uh, the sound uh, show. Sometimes there is many of when are talking about satellite and, and so, yeah, we have this definition. All of them, we you know, said journalist and media worker, but if you go to the report, you will find each number and each category separately. <clears throat> and in, in, in uh, Northeast, I'm sorry, I said 106 cases. Let me say that, as I said, uh, we have in general, we document, we accept 100, 1,670 case against individual and 661 against institution. From this number again, the Syrian regime responsible about 795 crime. In general, there is 720 uh, extra judicial killing from these numbers. 
the Syrian government responsible about 82% from this crime. Then we have, yes, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, Jibhat al-Nusra. We have the uh, military uh, rebel position, I don't know if we can say it. And then we have the uh, self-administration and we have Russia. Again, 78 crime responsible from the Russian Union. And they can and now be sure that, as I said, after I came from uh, Ukraine and go to Pocha, Bordenica, Somi, that it's the same mythology. And some of the, the, the Russian soldiers, they are more happy in Ukraine because they don't have this language problem. They say it. Ah, in Syria, it's not funny. Torture, killing, attacking, like here in Ukraine, because we have the problem of the language issue. I think I answer many things you don't ask. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Darvish. Um, I went through your report that uh, you issued in 2021. So I think this thing about how you define a journalist keeps coming up, and you have written in it that it's a very complex case. And I was trying to understand the case of the Al Jazeera journalist in 2013, Al Hurani, I think. And um, who was hit by two bullets and he had a microphone in his hand. And you've said in that box item that um, um, he wasn't wearing any identification, right? That he was press and that Al Jazeera also backed out. Is that right? Can you just explain to me? Because I'm trying to understand that even apart from the confusion about media workers, citizen journalists, uh, people who help established journalists who come in. Um, there is the additional thing you're saying where you would say that the person is killed because they're a journalist or because they're a journalist who have not followed the norms that journalists are supposed to follow in a situation of war. And therefore, would somebody like him being killed not be part of your statistic or would? You know, I'm just trying to understand because I realize there are many layers, and how have you reconciled this in your <coughs> own uh, documentation? Yeah. Oh. And again, we are talking about 1,670 cases. So if I don't have the, the specific details in each case by case, please forgive me. I have early Alzheimer. Uh, yeah, and in, in Muhammad Hurani case, we are. Again, in, in Syria, it's some kind of luxury. If you have journalists, have equipment. This is not the situation. And this is maybe, I don't know, one person, maybe from, from journalist, Syrian journalist, I'm not talking about the foreign media. So we are not talking about this uh, 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 romantic um, um, picture we said we saw it about the journalist who have his uh, children and the press and his Hamlet and everything and Cupid. Again, I don't. I, I, maybe I can count five, six. Maybe Syrian journalist document, and we try as even a Syrian center to provide a lot of, of journalists in, in this. And it, unfortunately, we didn't succeed. So <clears throat> even though, again, for Hamad al-Hawrani, if I remember correctly, he has a microphone. And he's don't have anything 
can anyone say that he's not a civilian, not journalist? And attack directly. So even if we are talking about this 720 journalist and media worker killing, those who we believe that they killed and there is a relation between their death and their work in journalism. So again, we are not talking about uh, a journalist who uh, do something bad for his wife and she banish him. We are talking about, yeah. I think what I was trying to understand is um, as a result of your documentation, um, you said earlier that you were sticking to the the formal uh, UN formulation of who is a journalist. But given the way things have developed post-2011, have you as SEM rethought this thing about how to define a journalist, uh, given that there are so many Syrians who are actually journalists, even if they don't have that professional label, uh, and as we heard earlier also, who are so crucial to the whole thing of documenting what is going on and reporting and getting the world to understand what is going on. So has SCM as an organization redefined uh, that as you continue to document, you know, the atrocities against Nabil. journalists? Yeah. Nabil. And Nabil, for instance, is a, is a classic example where I was, I was, I've been talking to others saying, even today in the what we read, he's described as a blogger. When actually he was, he has the qualifications of a journalist. He was um, crucial in setting up uh, this publication. And yet, you know, we don't speak of him as a journalist, which I find extraordinary because he obviously was, yeah. Yeah, no, I think, um, um, I mean, also, to be honest with you, let me say it. We try our best, not only SCM, many also, um, I can also mention FPU, RSF, um, um, CBG, many other also, international and other local even organization, try. But until now, today, after all of these numbers and facts, until now, believe me, we can't provide those journalists in safety equipment today. And safety equipment, safety equipment. So we try in, in, in several ways. Since 2011, for Nabil, I believe that I can understand how it's sometimes mixed between peaceful activist and journalist. Because to be honest with you, he was both. He do both together. But yeah, I can say that he's a journalist. He's an uh, uh, educate and, and work as journalist, even before an ability. He filming many um, protests in, in, in Daria, and he informed many media outlets, even if he don't use his uh, official name, or use nickname. And he sent a lot of information about what happened in, in, in Daria. And when, and I think Khulud description better than me about his rules in, in, in Anna Baladi and other. So yeah, I will consider him as a journalist. But yes, we are talking about uprising about revolution and about dreams of freedom for, for the Syrian and Nabil, one of them. 
So yes, he participated in many peaceful activists in, in, in this space. At what point did he become a journalist? He's journalist when the uprising start, he become activist and journalist. Thank you. I think your, your testimony has given us a lot to think about. <laughs> Thank you so much and, uh, for the work of SCM over so, such a long period too. Thank you very much. Actually, to be honest with you, this is my colleague work, especially those who's working in the media and the freedoms. I'm the, the, the evil one who's working in accountability as a lawyer in the court. So thanks for them. Thank you. Thank you very much.